Okay, this is uh, part two of the lecture on Metropolis Monte Carlo. Um, and uh, we talked before about uh, how the algorithm works. Um, and now we're just going to talk a little bit about initialization, what you do when you're starting off, because that can be quite uh, important. So um, if we have our particle in a well, like this particular well here, um, we can start the thing off anywhere we like, right? We can start it off down there, but it could also start it up here somewhere or over there. Okay, so, um, and where you start it can, in some cases, affect the results you get. Um, and let's look at why this is the case. So, suppose we have a particle in a parabolic well, with this as K hook as our, as our spring constant, then we know from equipetition that this is true. So equipetition tells us that every quadratic degree of freedom gives you half kBt in the, in the energy, and so therefore this, which is the energy associated with the spring, the well, must be equal to half kBt. So from that you can estimate the typical distance uh, which the particle lies at from the origin. So the average value of x squared, uh, the square root of that, is kBt divided by the spring constant. So it's that. Okay, so typically, you know, in a, in a well like this, depending on the temperature, you will lie somewhere in there, or if the temperature is high, you'll be lying somewhere out here. Uh, but you won't lie way out here unless the temperature is, is much, much, much higher. Okay, so if this is our typical distance from the origin, if we start a distance which is 10 to the 6 times that, so way, way, way more out, um, and we only wait local moves, so we only make these moves which are like slow local local moves like this, it's going to take us an awful long time to get into a situation where we're down the bottom of the well somewhere, down near where we should be, okay? So it's going to take a long time to get towards equilibrium, okay? So uh, what do we do? Well, of course, the thing in this system you would do is you would start the system, start typically start it off with this value of x, that would be a reason to do, but of course in some cases you can't do that. You can't, you don't really know where the equilibrium is. If you knew that much about the system, you probably wouldn't be doing the simulation at all. So what do you do? Well, one way of doing it is just experimentally. You equilibrate your system and you measure something like the average density or the average distance or something like that. And you just see when it stops changing significantly. So here we've got a system of... Uh, this data here is for some sort of system of spheres or disks or something, and they're measuring, they're allowing the density to vary, and they're measuring the density, okay? Um, and they start the density off down here at some particular value, and they just measured it after, you know, uh, 500,000 Monte Carlo steps to million, 1.5 million, 2 million, and they've noticed that it goes up gradually, and it's changing all the time, but then eventually it starts to plateau off, okay? And hopefully... If you kept measuring this, you'll find some fluctuations around like this, but it will keep going that way. And so what you do is you take all this data here and you throw it away. You say, well, that's, e that's out of equilibrium and we're not going we're gonna to ignore that. And this is the data you actually want to choose. So you only start measuring just there. So what you do is you, you wait a while and you discard the initial configurations, which are crazy, way out of line. Okay, so what can you do in Monte Carlo? Well, Metropolis Monte Carlo in particular is a wonderful method because its algorithm is so simple. Okay, you either go downhill or you go uphill with a very clear uh, algorithm for going uphill. And also, um, the sort of number of moves you can make, the different moves you can make, uh, there's an infinite number of them. You can do whatever you like. Um, for instance, when people are simulating polymer molecules, they can do, you know, crankshaft rotations of the molecule. They can pivot around points. They can move the molecule along its own length, rotate it. Um, and you can, when you have, if you have just little clusters of particles, you can rotate the cluster or you can scale the volume up, make it bigger. Um, there are all kinds of moves you can make. So they don't have to be local moves. They can be very, very crazy non-local moves. So you have a gas of particles like this. Here's my particles. I can take one of these particles and move it over there. That's, that's a fine move. Dynamically, it's not a good move. We're not dealing with dynamics here. We're dealing with equilibrium thermodynamics, equilibrium stat mech, and all kinds of moves you can't make uh, in the real world you can make uh, on a, uh, in a stat mech simulation like this. Okay? You can move many particles at once. If you have a system, a system of spins, you can, don't just have to, you know, if I have like five spins in a row, 
I don't have to flip uh, only one of the spins. I could flip all five. Just flip them all. Okay, and that would be okay as well. Um, however, there are limitations. If you take uh, a system and uh, you just use crazy kinds of uh, moves where the energy increases dramatically, they'll keep getting rejected. Okay? Um, and so, uh, for instance, if I have a polymer, here's a polymer, which is, say, lots of beads and springs, or little springs in between them. Okay, here's my beads and springs, a model of a polymer. And if I take this particular monomer here, this particular atom, and I shift it way down there, right? This particular spring is gonna stretch like that, this one's gonna stretch like that, uh, and the energy will be just sky high, and it'll be rejected, okay? So stupid moves where the energy is, you know, gets large suddenly, they're rejected all the time. There's not much point in making them. If you're gonna make a move like this, what you do is you take your monomer and you move it a little tiny bit like that. Let's see, hopefully that will work, okay? If you have a high rejection rate, uh, you've got uh, inefficient sets of moves. So you just don't do that. Okay, so I've, got, I've talked about this before, why it works. It works because the system is minimizing its free energy. So the free energy is energy minus temperature times entropy. Um, and basically the two parts of the Monte Carlo process either minimize U or they maximize S. Uh, which is effectively minimizing T times S, and that's why it works. It works well. That's that's the hand waving way of why it works. Okay, that's not proof. It's the hand waving way, hand waving explanation. Okay, so um, let's look at the paper. So the paper was written. Uh, this is why it's called Metropolis. The first author was a, a gentleman called Nicholas Metropolis, um, and it was written in uh, well received in 1953, March 6, 1953. It appeared in June 1953. Um, and you can see this is very much just at the dawn of the computer age, um, and uh, this computer was probably in Los Alamos, so it's a Los Alamos maniac computer, there it is, um, and they looked at systems of, 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 of rigid spheres, uh, two-dimensional rigid spheres, what would be disks in other words, um, some with 56 particles and some with 224 particles, which doesn't seem very many by today's standards, but it was, it was a lot back then. Um, so the other authors besides Metropolis are two uh, sets of married couples, uh, Edward Teller and Augusta Teller. Um, Edward Teller is, of course, famous for being the father of the hydrogen bomb. Um, and then uh, Ariana Rosenbluth and Marshall Rosenbluth, the other two authors there. So, okay, so they're, they're the authors of this, character, of this paper. And, you know, basically there aren't many places where you can have access to a computer and Los Alamos was one of them. Okay, so here they are. Uh, the two Rosenbluths there and there. Uh, we've got the two Tellers there and there. And Metropolis is the odd man out being not married to any one of the group. Okay. Uh, and so there's Metropolis again. There he is. Um, so 50 years after the paper was written, just before his death, um, Rosenbluth asserted that he and his wife Ariana did all the work and the Metropolis just provided the computer time. Uh, difficult to check this uh, assertion. Um, only Ariana of the five authors is still alive at the moment. Um, and uh, so um, the thing I would say about this is that this kind of thing happens all the time in science. You see papers with enormous numbers of authors. In this case, there are only, there are only five authors. But you often see papers with many, many authors. Uh, and um, often it's only one or two people who've actually done anything significant on it. And that's that's the way things operate. Um, and uh, whether you think that's completely ethical or not, it's the way things work. Um, okay, some pictures of the tellers playing chess, you know, um, and there's this teller with Mr. Mr. Kennedy, the President Kennedy. Um, and okay, so um, application, let's do an application of this, some, some data from a typical, um, very simple kind of uh, uh, metropolis algorithm. Here's the easing model, the easing model, which we'll study later on. It consists of a series of spins, it might be in two dimensions or three dimensions or n dimensions, um, interacting with their neighbours. This this SI is the spin of one of them, SJ is the spin of another one, uh, and this is some maybe over nearest neighbours. And you select a spin and flip it, and this is the algorithm, this is the the um, how would I say the, the the Hamiltonian you're going to be using basically. Okay, depending on whether the sign is here or is positive or negative, depends on whether they want to align or anti-align. Okay. And if they want to align, um, you can measure the magnetization, which is the average number of spins per unit volume in a particular direction, 
versus the temperature and you will get data of this kind whereas at high temperatures you'll get nothing and suddenly at a critical temperature uh, you will suddenly get an increase in magnetization and we'll see later on that's the second order phase transition but if you have a system which you can average over things enough you will get this kind of data out of your uh, out of your easing model although this data is very clean uh, and um, you have to do a lot of averaging to get that so what problems does the Metropolis uh, Monte Carlo algorithm have? Well, um, the problem is Metropolis was not the Messiah, and he is not the Messiah, uh, and so this is not the solution to every kind of problem you will ever face. Okay? Um, one of the problems you will face in, with Metropolis Monte Carlo is it can get stuck. So suppose we have some molecules with attracting interactions. Um, they you switch on the interactions, they start to cluster, uh, and they start to form big, you know, big clusters like this, and then all those clusters will cluster together and form a much bigger cluster. Uh, but once you've done that, it can be very, very difficult for something here to leave and go out to there. For instance, a bit, a little bit of it can break off um, because the energy barrier is so high. So that's a, a very simple example. But you can get stuck in configurations where you cannot sample the entire phase space, and therefore you don't really get the um, the proper equilibrium configurations. If you had infinite amounts of computer time and you were prepared to run it forever, you would you would sample all the space space, but uh, you just can't do that. And so you run, you run into difficulty sometimes with systems with attractive interactions that become very dense. You can't move the system. You know, you, this atom here, down here, this red one, you can't move it easily where the blue ones are, for example. It's not going to work, okay? So, um, so that's one thing that can go wrong. Um, there are also pitfalls in how you sample things. Um, so you must follow the underlying metric of the space when making moves, and you must also be very careful of introducing stupid biases. So sometimes these biases are very obviously wrong, but sometimes you can introduce them and you know it won't be too obvious to you, and you wonder what the hell's going on in your simulation. So um, you know an obvious error for a one D particle. Suppose I have a particle moving in one D. Here's 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 X and I can move my particle in 1D, okay? Um, but if I only ever move it to the right, of course, I miss out on all these bits here, back here. So, you know, so obviously you have to move it backwards and forwards. I mean, so that's an obvious error. Um, a less obvious error would be, say, using 3D spherical polars for your coordinates. So you don't have to use X, Y, and Z. You don't have to use Cartesian coordinates. You could use spherical polars, you know, R, theta, phi uh, set, okay? Um, now, um, normally, you know, you can add a random number to phi, a random number d phi, and get a new phi, okay, um, to get, uh, say, changing this angle. That's okay, however. However, if you were changing theta, the correct variable in theta space is cos theta, i.e., in this integral here, in the volume element, it's sine theta d theta, which is d cos theta, at least, like that, okay? So... You have to me you have to change uh, cos theta randomly, not theta. You will get biases if you choose theta from the uniform distribution, for example. Okay. Um, similarly, for R, for R, you wouldn't choose R from some uniform distribution. You would choose R cubed from uniform distribution because it's d R, um, R cubed is the um, is the volume element. Okay. So all this kind of stuff matters. You have to. You have to be really careful if you're not using uh, Cartesian coordinates, you're using some weird coordinate systems. Okay, so it's just the same as you have to do that if you're doing integrals. Okay, you already know that for integration. Okay, so how do how do you you know how do you test these things out? Well, see if you've done things right. Uh, a good test is to set the Hamiltonian neural system to zero, and see if your computer program spits out a completely uniform distribution in phase space. If that's the case, then you, you know, you've got something right. Okay, and if it isn't the case, you've done something wrong. Okay, all right. So the Hamiltonian is zero. So we've talked about Metropolis Monte Carlo only here. There are innumerable Monte Carlo methods. A new one is published every day. Um, there are many algorithms of that sort of kind. Um, some of these claim, and in fact, do overcome certain problems associated with Metropolis. But sifting through all of them is, is incredibly difficult because there are so many of them. Um, and there are many algorithms associated, for example, with dense liquids. You have a liquid like, you know, just like water, for example. You have the water molecules here. 
um, you know, and you've got to, you know, okay, what am I going to do with that water molecule? I can't move them there or there. What am I doing? I, maybe I can swap those two around or something, but um, things which are dense, like here's the Kaaba in Mecca, right? You know, if you're in the Kaaba, you know, and you're circling the Kaaba, you're one of these people down here, um, you know, you can't just move anywhere. You're going to get tripped in someone's toes and exactly the same in a dense liquid. So there's all kinds of issues associated with reaching equilibrium, which uh, these other methods, which we're not going to talk about, try and solve. Okay. So let's talk about a little bit about the rules of engagement with, with real computer simulation. You're writing a computer simulation. Um, what can go wrong? Well, just about everything can go wrong. Um, but the real problem is that computer simulations are written by humans, and humans make mistakes regularly. Uh, you can just guarantee it. Human witnesses, for instance, are always unreliable all the time. You know that it causes tremendous problems in court cases because, you know, the the uh, the prosecution or the or the defence can absolutely rip into a witness because you know half the stuff they're saying is you know a bit, you know they don't remember it properly or they're lying. Okay, so you know this is this is this is why then the motto of the Royal Society is this one nullius in verba, which is basically means take no one's word for it. Only believe the experiment. Do not believe a human being. They're going to lie. They're going to make mistakes. Okay? And the problem with computers is that they're even more unreliable than people. Okay? Because they're programmed by people and the people make mistakes. And when they're making mistakes, they don't realise it. So most people who are programming computers aren't actually lying about things. Uh, they're just making honest mistakes. And those honest mistakes, you know, well, they get amplified by the computer uh, and so the computer just puts out bullshit. Okay, so computers are, are wonderful bullshit amplifiers. Um, and they amplify the mistakes which humans make. So that sounds very negative. Okay, so what can we do? Um, well, well, I'll tell you what to do yet. But, uh, well, you know, this gets back to the idea of what, what a computer can do. So in nature, where you have nature figuring out what to do, nature or God or whatever you want to call it, always gets things right. That's by definition, Okay. If you're human and you're um, you're doing this kind of thing, you're going to act. You know, you're pretending you're God, but you're going to be introducing typos. Um, and God doesn't do typos. Nature doesn't do typos. So that's why experiments always beat computer simulations in terms of reliability. If you're, you know, if you're designing an aircraft by computer, uh, you wouldn't get into it. You'd first have to do a test. Make sure, make sure it actually flies before you start getting into it. Okay. So what do we do? Well, there are certain things you can do to make things reliable. And this is for any computer code, obviously, but for the ones in statistical physics where it's really complicated, um, you really have to be really careful. So what you do, if you can, is to get two people independently to write two completely independent codes, maybe using different methods or different languages, and see if they produce the same kind of results. If they don't, you have to ask yourself why, okay? If the output you get from your program is what you expected, it's probably right. Okay, okay, the output looks like what I expect. Um, but um, in that case, why did you bother writing the code in the first place if you've got the output you expected? You know, just, you know, what have you learned? Okay, if the output is unexpected, and this is the more important case, this is the case where really computers start to become useful. You get an unexpected output, um, but then if you think about the output, you say, ah, that is what I expected to see, but I just wasn't clever enough to see it. And the computer has given you a hint about what you really should have expected to see. And so they help the computer, you know, makes you a little bit more like Onsaga or Fermi or Oppenheimer or all these guys who will understand what's going on. So it can make a stupid person increase their intelligence a little bit. Um, and you can see sometimes what you should have you should have seen before you programmed, but just couldn't. Okay. Uh, the worst case is if the output is unexpected and you cannot explain it, um, then there's almost certainly something wrong with your code, there are bugs, or you've got the physics wrong. Okay, And in which case, that's really frustrating because um, uh, if, if that's the case, uh, then you really um, you know, have to go back to the drawing board and check everything. Okay, all right, so... That's the end of uh, this particular lecture. Thanks.